Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, joined by attorney Cesar Gavidia. And today, Cesar, we're going to talk about how much neck pain does it take to get a long-term disability insurance claim approved. And you know right away that when we talk about how much pain that you're probably thinking like, what are you talking about? Because how are we supposed to measure pain when it comes to proving a disability claim? And right off the bat, why isn't there a measure of pain? And why is that one of the biggest aspects in every claim that's kind of like what I, I think the measure of pain is this fraudulent concept amongst disability carriers. Um, and I, I just want you to address that issue in this video about talking about pain and also with regard to all types of neck disorders that we've dealt with through helping thousands of claimants dealing with this, providing some tips about how to protect themselves if they're already on claim and things that will help them to get on claim if they're either applying or they've been denied. So getting right into it, why is it this concept of measuring pain is a real falsehood? So yeah, I mean, it's a real trivial kind of issue and question because, you know, there really is no way to measure the amount of pain somebody's in. It's a completely um, subjective, uh, you know, real, real um, thing uh, because it's reported by the patient, by the claimant, um, and the frequency, the intensity, that all has to be reported by them. There's not going to be a machine or there's not going to be anything the doctor is going to be able to visualize and see on you that's going to tell them, oh, now I see how much pain you're in. I mean, you could be in the examination room screaming in pain. They're going to believe you're in pain. But that's not how generally they're assessing your, your uh, level of pain. You're reporting to them you know, that this is what's causing my pain. This is how often it's occurring. This is how intense it is. They sometimes even give you a scale, like where would you measure it on a scale of one to 10? And if you look at some of those forms that you fell out when you go to your doctor's examination, that might be something they're asking about. But other than that, I mean, really, it's just a measure of um, what you report to them. And so when we talk about specifically with neck disorders, pain is subjective. It means it's something that is a, is a complaint. It's not something physical that you can see. And objective evidence is things that you can't obviously see. What is the types of objective evidence that are the, the best types of evidence that somebody can obtain who has a neck disorder type disability so, claim? Yeah, so you know what we're do what their insurance company is looking for, what the disability insurer is looking for is that correlation of your diagnosis or your symptoms to the pain that you're experiencing. So certainly with the neck disorder. Um, you know, just one of the fundamental diagnostic studies and tests that you want is an MRI, right? Um, and that's something that your doctor will most likely order if you report that you are having, you know, this, in, this intense pain in your, in, your, in your spine, in your neck. Um, the other thing is if you're having symptoms that are radiating, right, or that are tr basically traveling, through your extremities, through your, either your legs or through your upper arms, since we're talking about the neck here, uh, upper your arms into your, into your wrists, into your hands, then they may ask or look for uh, some sort of neurological uh, issue. They may be asking, is there something neurological here? Is there some sort of nerve involvement, nerve damage, nerve compression? Um, that's something they might find on the MRI, but also to see if there's any damage or injury to those nerves, they might re report or request a uh, in, um, EMG nerve conduction study. And so the, the nerve conduction studies are, are can be good sources. Obviously, if you come back, it's going to show that you have some kind of radiculopathy, which is going to be another type of objective evidence um, in, in addition to an MRI, in addition to an x-ray, which is only going to show the bones. But it's going to be almost impossible to get approved on a neck disorder claim if you don't have some kind of objective testing. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to have a result of an MRI that shows you have some giant herniation which is impinging the nerve root or you have severe osteophytic formations or neuroforaminal narrowing in your neck because every doctor will say, look, I don't treat the chart, I treat the patient. And it's the same thing in a disability claim. You know, you're dealing with your complaints. The problem is, 
is that just like a doctor doesn't treat just the chart and treats the patient, the problem is that the disability company, they treat the chart, meaning you know they only look at the records. They don't necessarily care so much about what you tell them, they care about what's in the records. So how do you work with your clients and what do you recommend in terms of getting the best possible documentation into the medical records so that they can be in the best spot to get their benefits approved? Yeah, so there, that comes with that kind of fundamental uh, thing we, we, we talk about in our field, which is you're almost as disabled as you appear in your medical records and, and on your, in, in those charts, because that's exactly right. They, they do treat the chart. They look at the chart and the records very, very closely to see um, what your issues are, what the diagnoses are, what the symptoms are, how you're being treated for them, how often you're, you're reporting how uh, intense this pain is, how frequent this pain is, and where it's occurring and what types of activities, um, and how long you've had it. So, uh, you know, how do you, how do you prepare for that? Well, it's, the only way to do that is just constantly reporting and go and, you know, frequently reporting to your doctors. And you really have to be sometimes your own best advocate reviewing and having these medical records on hand to ensure that they're being accurate, that your complaints are accurately being documented. And, uh, you know, doctors are not often the best historians and record keepers. Uh, sometimes they farm this, this type of stuff out. And, um, you know, their medical assistant may be the one who's doing the dictation or putting these, these things into the notes. So you need to really have a, a fundamental understanding of what's in your medical records um, and re report often um, and report frequent or keep charts, keep logs, keep things so that you, when you report to your doctor, you can go in and you can say, here's when I experienced th th these problems. Here's how often it occurred. Here's how intense it was. Here's what type of activity I was engaged in when it was happening. So along the lines of what you're saying, Caesar, some additional tips that I always like to offer for my clients also is this theme of looking messed up on paper is what I call it, is that you have to, you, you probably have a view to say, look, I'll try that, I'll try this, but I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna help because I've done other things or I've heard from somebody else. But when you're talking about how you're gonna look on paper, you need to communicate with your doctors and say, doctor, what other types of medications can I try? I know we've tried two or three. Can we try another one? Um, what other types of testing can I get? I know we did an MRI. Is there something else I can do? Is there something new? Can you send me for an EMG or nerve conduction study test? Is there some kind of new fluoroscopic type exam that I can have done? What other types of injections can I possibly get? Can you send me to a uh, pain management anesthesiologist or a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor and and can I should I go through a set of injections in my neck so that I can see you know um, if those are gonna work and what happens is 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 we like to have paint a picture for our clients where we can basically say look our client has tried everything there is to try short of surgery right because there are other things you can do. Also, did you do all the therapies? Did you try all the medicine? Did you try the injections? And I'm not saying you have to get injections, but they often say if you're in so much pain, why didn't you try a potential remedy? So the more you do, the worse off you're gonna look on paper and the better position you're gonna be in with the claim. And Caesar, right. since I touched on surgery, we often recommend that claimants treat with a or at least consult with an orthopedic doctor or a neurosurgeon and the reason for that is because we want to know if there's a surgical remedy now this can be a double-edged sword as you know sometimes because the doctors you know people think you walk into a surgeon's office are always going to say yeah you need to have surgery because they get paid if you have surgery but my experience is if you're going to a quality doctor it's not the way it's going to happen and they're usually not going to recommend surgery unless you're in a situation of paralysis, meaning where you're going to have some serious spinal cord damage that if you don't have the surgery, and we're talking about the neck, that 
you could become paralyzed. You could lose complete feeling in your hands or your arms or movement or something like that. And they're doing surgery to try to stabilize your condition. But the double-edged sword type situation is that if you're not already treating with an orthopedic doctor or you're not treating with the neurosurgeon and you go to them, they may not want to fill out anything about your restrictions and limitations. They may not want to fill out paperwork for the disability company. And why can that become a problem for someone? And how important is the quality of the attending physician statements that are completed by treating doctors? Yeah, I mean, they're extremely important. It's extremely important to have that paperwork and documentation completed by your treating doctors. The problem is, is that, you know, primary care family physicians, general practitioners, um, they often don't want to be completing this paperwork. So a surgeon, a neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon, it's le even less likely that they're going to want to complete this type of paperwork. So, um, you know, it despite how important it is, um, it's important that you have this communication, a good communication, good rapport with your doctor, with your surgeon, so that they understand what it is that you need. Um, sometimes that conflicts with what they're setting out to do for you. If they're going to be, you know, doing a spinal surgery that is supposed to be, uh, you know, alleviate or, or resolve in their minds your problem for you, I mean, that's why they're justifying this, this surgery, they're most likely going to expect that you're gonna be back at, at least a physical capacity to return to a, st to a certain quality of life or, or even work capability. So you really have to engage your doctor and they have to understand you know, before surgery and after surgery what the ongoing limitations are that you have. And, and that is a great point that you brought up that I wasn't even thinking about before about the fact that surgeons are like proud of their work and they feel like, wait a second, I just did surgery on you. Why aren't you back to normal? But more often than not, the surgery is, a is like a stabilization and a, a stop the bleeding. It's to stop making things get worse than they already are. And the reality is every claimant we have, if they could have a surgery and go back to work, they want to because they're always going to make so much more money working than they are on disability. So it's, it, it's a falsehood when the disability carrier is like, well, you had surgery and you should be better, get back to work. Well, it's insulting right. because if you're the claimant, you want to go back to work. You would love to go back and do your job if you could. So surgery doesn't mean you're better. It means the condition got so severe that you couldn't take it anymore and maybe you have less pain but you right. still have symptoms it's, and you still have functional limitations. I mean, think in terms of a race car and the engine blows out and you, you know, you replace the engine while well, you have a whole new engine, but surgeons aren't replacing your entire spine, right? They're fixing a component of it and you're not going to go back to racing. You're not going to most likely in, in most cases go back to full capacity. I've had many clients that they've had surgery, neck surgery, and they've successfully returned to some level of work. But that's not every case. Every case, you know, is unique. In some cases, they're going to remain totally disabled and they're not going to be able to return because really the surgery, like you said, is, is kind of to stop the bleeding, to kind of stabilize and now maintain a certain ability in life, quality of life. If they go back to, you know, standing for four or five hours and in, in, their, in their job and performing their job duties, how soon before they are they start to break down again right and and you know the other thing with the neck conditions is that they're almost always chronic medical conditions and someone doesn't just wake up and be like oh i have a neck condition i'm out of work they're usually dealing with them for six months a year or two years and then they you know and hopefully they've been getting medical treatment which is what you really need to do to support the claim and then they stop working and the classic argument is well you had those symptoms and that diagnosis for two years and now all of a sudden you stopped working. So, you know, we're prepared to deal with that issue. It's probably the most common issue that we deal with on a daily basis. The other issue that comes up Caesar all the time, which really infuriates us, but it's probably 90% of the denials we do is the claims get approved. They put them on claim for a year or 18 months or four years. They have a chronic cervical condition. And then the carrier says, oh, we had your file reviewed by somebody. We don't think that you're 
uh, complaints are supported by your objective evidence and we think you can work now. And that always blows my mind. I mean, how could you have been better? Your neck is degenerative by nature. It's only going to get worse over time. How now are you better? And that goes back to what we were saying in the beginning of this video where you got to exhaust all of the available remedies for treatment and care and see all the doctors and therapists and consultants that you can so that you always fall back on that argument to be able to say, look, I've done everything I could. It's been a year. It's been two years. It's been five years. Unless some miracle drug came out or some miracle type surgery or something happened, I'm not getting better. But you can't rest. You got to keep up with all of that treatment. So if you're a claimant who has a neck condition, we encourage you to reach out to myself or Caesar. We help clients all over the country. We always provide initial free consultation where we're going to review your policy or review your denial letter. We're going to let you know immediately how we can help you. We encourage you to spend some time looking through our website, looking up by your medical condition or your disability company or your occupation. We have lots of summaries about lawsuits and other cases that we've handled, reviews from other clients about your company, questions and answers that you may be thinking that we've already answered. And we want you to have this information because the more educated you are, the better position you're going to be in to get your benefits approved. This is a game, Caesar, as you know, in terms of having a strategy, being prepared and thinking like the company. It's also a war. I hate to use all these cheesy analogies, but you have to be ready and you have to think like them in order to be in the best position to get benefits approved. So we look forward to the opportunity to help you and we'll be here should you need us at any time in the future. Thank you.